So welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, Market Thursday, uh, March the 10th. So thank you for watching tonight and thank you for those of you who will be watching later. Uh, so this, um, this webinar is called 50% uh, chances of a recession. Uh, as we're gonna see later, uh, stocks, uh, the equity market are, are, are now pricing 50% uh, chance of the US going into a recession. Um, so very quickly, let me uh, go through my um, CV. So I started to work in 2000 in Paris as a long uh, cash equity trader working for uh, Pierre Charon Gestion, uh, where we managed 50 million euros. Uh, then in 2004, I started to work um, here in London for a hedge fund, uh, both on the long only product and on long, long short product, where the overall company was managing 3 billion. And I was part of a team that was managing uh, 600 million. Uh, in 2009, I joined uh, as a prop trader Infinity Capital Markets here in London, where I had an absolute uh, return mandate with no asset and regions constraint. I started to mentor people from all over the world in, in 2014, working before for another company. Then I launched my own company in 2018, uh, where I had uh, in uh, October uh, 2019, the launch of the 4x4 video series and doing mentoring as well. Uh, and since uh, last year, since uh, January 2021, now we started doing prop trading for Infinity. So I'm doing both mentoring and uh, prop trading. So what about today? Today, uh, we're gonna be covering, uh, as always, we're gonna be starting with the situation across asset classes, looking at stocks, uh, credit, commodities, and FX, a quick market review, and how have been the recent performances. Uh, the second part, which is gonna be pretty brief, but still um, about the US economy, uh, is a uh, recession coming in the US. Uh, we're gonna be looking at different factors and to see um, what is in the pipeline. Then we're gonna be talking about the European markets. Why? Because uh, due to the uh, Ukraine crisis or the war, um, European markets have been uh, quite volatile and, and have been underperforming the overall market. They have been much more volatile than the overall market. Uh, so there are many opportunities for us uh, as a traders and investors. Um, and I would like to do a bit of introduction of how to drill down into the sectors level uh, in Europe. So that's something that I discussed in the 4x4 video series, but I thought it was a good um, opportunity today to do a bit of, um, of introduction of, of those markets. Then we're going to be uh, covering uh, quickly the oil market and what is the impact of, uh, of the, those different embargoes and um, in terms of which imbalance it is creating uh, in, in the market. So uh, today we got the ECB, so the central banks in Europe, uh, that uh, said that clearly inflation is uh, is much more important than the, what they were expecting before. They increased their expectations by quite a lot for for this year and for next year. Why? Because we know that due to the to the war in Ukraine, um, what the, the world is now facing is is a commodity crisis. Um, so uh, many commodities or almost all co commodities are going through the roof. Um, and we know as well that inflation was running pretty high. Um, so we, were to, we are talking today, we had the US CPI, uh, where the US CPI, the core CPI was above 7%. So this is something that we haven't had for the last uh, four years, uh, sorry, 40 years. And even on the months to months on month, um, the US CPI is, is pretty high. So that, um, that means inflation is going to be running hot, uh, at least for 2022. Um, so what the central banks are going to be doing, um, ECB today said they were, that they will be uh, sound very much more hawkish, meaning that they're going to be raising rates um, uh, probably at the end of this year. Um, in terms of catalyst going forward, what we have is the, the Fed, the, 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 the central bank for, for the US, which is meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday, and the expectations are expected um, on, on Wednesday. Uh, with the outcome with the Fed raising uh, rates. Um, and for the next few months, um, market participants are expecting the Fed to be uh, pretty hawkish and, and raising rates by probably almost 1% uh, before June of this year. So that's, that's some of the catalysts that we'll be looking. As always, we got the expiry of options uh, next Friday. Uh, but more or less, the market is, is, is very much driven by the headlines in, in Ukraine. Uh, market is not 
that much liquid. So that means you have a lot of big moves, a lot of volatility. When there is volatility like we have these days with implied volatility in the VIX being above 30%, what comes with this is very often you have poor liquidity. Uh, so that explains the moves that we've seen recently. You probably saw or not seen uh, the move in the DAX yesterday by 7% plus. Um, today we are down two to 3%. So it's a bit of a yo-yo but overall the market is, is clearly coming down. Uh, there is not much of, of, of strong support so far. Uh, we had a bit of a support on Monday on the European markets that made uh, some lows. Uh, that's something we're gonna be covering in the technical analysis. So going into the asset classes performances year to date, uh, so that's something we always do. The picture is, is still the same with, with equity, uh, pretty much down around 10% year to date um, with Europe underperforming a bit the, the overall market. Um, on the FX side, the, uh, the, the dollar has been pretty strong, uh, up two to 3% versus uh, most of the currencies. Why? Because there is, as always, when, when there is crisis, like we had over the last couple of months, uh, there is a flight to safety and, and, and the dollar becomes uh, king again. Um, Bitcoin, what is interesting, hasn't been doing the job so far for the year. So the, um, the idea that Bitcoin will be doing very well in, in, a, in a risk of market has not been uh, really uh, validated. We are down 10% on Bitcoin um, and WTI, uh, meaning oil, is up 45%. Uh, so those prices are, are as of yesterday, uh, close, but... Um, Oil is now trading above 100, uh, went to almost $130 uh, yesterday. So uh, pretty much uh, up 40 to 50%. The gold um, up 9% yesterday, came down today at 3%, uh, but gold uh, at least um, did a better job than, than Bitcoin in this risk of situation. Week to date, um, and do, do you, we have big changes from one week to another even from one day to another. So if you look for the S&P uh, over the last uh, three to four sessions, S&P has been moving roughly by 120 to 150 points, which is three to 4%. So we have on the futures uh, roughly three to 4% intraday move. Um, so those moves literally are normally moves that we could see on a monthly basis, but they, they happen literally every single day. And what is interesting is those moves are across asset classes. So it's not only stocks, it's bonds, uh, equities, um, uh, uh, sorry, FX and commodities. So across asset classes, there is a lot of volatility. Uh, it feels like um, some investors, you know, who have to run a big exposure and big books uh, have been struggling. Uh, there is a kind of rotation in the pain. We go from commodities where a couple of days ago, we had the news that the nickel was uh, halted due to the fact that one uh, Chinese investor was under a margin call of $2 billion plus. Uh, today, uh, you get the Chinese stocks uh, that are down 10%. So every single day, there is pain somewhere. Um, and that creates a lot of volatility and a lot of uncertainty. But as well, uh, as I said before, a very strong volatility. Uh, so in other words, when we are running book these days, we, and that's something that I've been uh, saying for the last six weeks, uh, we should be reducing the gross exposure, the net exposure. Why? Because when the market is moving twice or three times more than usual, you need to be reducing the size by 50 or 66%. Uh, that is prorata of the moves that you have. So uh, in terms of sectors, uh, the picture is, is, is still the same with, with the XLE uh, energy up 35%, which goes hand in hand with the with oil market being very, being very strong. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, you can see that most sectors um, are down ex except utilities as well, because uh, there is a, a fly to, uh, to how to, um, um, to get rid of, of oil and, and, and helping. So utilities, uh, not only uh, in the US, but in Europe, uh, we are talking renewables are doing pretty well, uh, but you can see uh, in the meantime that consumer discretionary is really struggling and, and, and technology as well. 
uh, week to date, uh, the, the picture is, is almost irrelevant uh, in, in a sense that, um, again, there is a lot of volatility, but the bottom line is, is, is very similar to here, uh, which is utilities and energy have been doing pretty well uh, um, uh, recently on the year and over the last couple of weeks. Um, Next one on the commodities, I uh, just wanted to give you a, a quick uh, picture. We all know it's making the headlines, so you don't need to be a genius to know that uh, commodities have been pretty strong on the year. Um, from the, the, the nickel uh, um, squeeze on the palladium, uh, not a squeeze, but strong performance. Why? Because Russia is, is a big uh, producer of this um, commodity, oil, gasoline. Um, and you can see that um, if you put aside wood, all commodities have been on the way up and we are talking for most of them uh, from here to their double digit on the year. So uh, to come back on the on the inflation, that will create inflation and that creates a, a lot of, of, of squeezes around those, those commodities. So um, if you're trading them uh, through ETF, through um, futures, um, those, those products will be extremely volatile uh, during those sessions. Uh, countries, very quickly, I just wanted to give you some picture and, and because this is something that we're going to uh, be talking more today is, is really the picture, which is this one, which is uh, Europe that has been really underperforming the overall market. That makes complete sense. Why? Because, you know, Ukraine is, is in Europe. Um, and uh, this part of the world is, is much more uh, affected than the, the rest of the world. So uh, a lot of, um, of volume, a lot of volatility um, has been uh, in, in around Europe, uh, plus a lot of underperformance. Um, looking into the next, next slide, um, uh, something that um, uh, is important is looking at uh, yields, so bonds, uh, US 10 year now is, is around 2%, so it's almost at, almost at back to um, its recent highs. Um, there has been today a big move across the yields in Europe. Uh, why? Because, uh, as I said before, the, the, the ECB has been quite hawkish. So um, yields in, in, um, in, in Italy, for instance, have been up 20, 20 bips, 0.2%. Uh, so um, a lot of, um, of, of, of sell-off um, in, in bonds, yields going up. Um, in terms of VIX, in terms of volatility, uh, VIX is definitely above 30%, uh, which implies uh, roughly 2 to 3% move on the S&P. In the winners and losers, uh, something that you can be doing, uh, checking at any point in time, you know, what are the stocks that have been moving recently? And here I'm doing on, on, on a weekly uh, basis. Um, looking at the top winners and the top losers, obviously you're going to have some uh, Russian stocks. Uh, some now are, are definitely halted and never going to be trading again. Um, so look at uh, after the sector or the industry is looking at which uh, uh, stocks have been doing uh, pretty well or not. Um, let's go now into the technical analysis uh, before going into the recession. Uh, so let's start as always with, with, with the S&P. So the picture on the S&P, if you remember correctly, a couple of weeks ago, we were in the middle of, um, of, of a short, um, short term squeeze, uh, but the picture is, is more or less the same. The downtrend is still ongoing. Um, I don't see significant support uh, until the 3,900, uh, meaning that there is potentially another 300 points on the downside, uh, six to seven percent. Um, but the yo-yo, the moves, you can see the sizes of the candles uh, that are much, much bigger. So as long as we get uh, uncertainty as we have these days, we're going to have big, big moves. Uh, so that, that is the picture for the S&P. Uh, the, the NASDAQ is, is as, uh, no, sorry, it's not the up, NASDAQ. Um, up. So the, the picture of the, the NASDAQ is the same. Uh, the, we broke the uptrend um, at this, a couple of months ago or six weeks ago. And since then, we have been uh, trending lower. There is not much um, support until the 20 to the 1200. Um, you can't, I can't see your screen. Uh, guys, can you see my screen, the other ones? I'm just asking, just checking if you can see. Yes, okay. So um, I think it's a problem for you, Damien, uh, not on my side. Uh, so 
um, Nasdaq, uh, there is probably at least the uh, same things, seven to eight percent downside. Um, there is no, there is no uh, real bounce. Uh, price action is very weak uh, across those those different uh, uh, products. Let's look um, one that we uh, the Russell. Russell is the same picture. I think the downside is even more um, significant. Uh, we are talking for potentially 15% from here. Um, so we are consolidating on, 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 on the Russell, but I, I don't see much support. Um, I want to move a bit into, into Europe, um, looking at the DAX. So we discussed the DAX, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, when we say that 4,800 was broken. Uh, since then, it has been in free fall. Um, again, no support. Um, there has been big candles, as you can see, um, with Monday being some kind of a reversal. If we look at, um, at the Euro stocks 50, which is the biggest, uh, uh, the, the 50 biggest stocks in, in Europe, actually there was a trading signal on, on Monday that I had. I didn't do it, unfortunately, because don't ask me why I didn't do it. But um, probably because on Monday it was the, the end of the world uh, in the very first two hours. But um, there has been a bit of a support on, on, on the euro stocks. But if you, if you look back at, at, at charts, like, um, like actually if you look at 2020, uh, when, uh, starts to, uh, when those things start to unwind, it could be very quickly. So it, it's hard to be, to be putting it in a bit. Uh, uh, next one into emerging market. So emerging market has been really, really struggling. So if you remember, we have been looking at emerging markets. We have been saying, you know, we need to have a signal up or down. Um, now it clearly it's on the way down, obviously because of Russia, but uh, actually China has been very, uh, very weak as well recently. Uh, so the, um, the picture now in emerging market is not looking great. Let's look at something that has been doing very well, uh, which is the XLE uh, with the energy sector. So energy sector back to levels that we had in, in, in 2018, 2019. But if you look at some names in the XLE, like CVX, uh, for instance, with Chevron, uh, actually those, those charts have been absolutely parabolic. Uh, so there, there is, um, and there is obviously a, a, a lot of uh, speculation around those names. Uh, uh, it is clear that on the XLE and energy, many, many investors have been under, uh, um, underweight uh, the, the sector for several reasons, because, you know, uh, many people never recovered from the 2015, 2016 sell-off because due to ESG uh, criteria, where many investors in their mandate were not allowed uh, to be buying oil stocks. Uh, so now, and there is a lot of inflows going into the sector. Retail is, is keen on those names. Be very cautious on all, uh, be cautious why? Because, you know, when you have moved on, on, when you go from 130 to 170 in literally uh, uh, 10 days, uh, you can see that um, uh, there is a, a risk of reversion to the mean. So if you have been in those names, uh, uh, keep the winners. Otherwise, be extremely careful. Today, um, let me give you Baba, uh, Alibaba. Why I want to give you Baba? Because Baba is making new lows today. Uh, and actually, if you look at the, at the volume, it's going to be a very significant day. So we, um, an hour ago, we're already trading 20 million shares or more. All the, the Chinese stocks have been uh, uh, really struggling today. Um, they are down, I think the, uh, what's the, 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 the index, the uh, HXC index um, is down uh, similarly 10%. 10 so we are back to level that we've seen in 2015, 2016. Uh, why uh, emerging market? Uh, you don't want to have exposure to China. Uh, China is literally closing big time uh, everything inland because of, uh, of COVID. And um, I think there is some, um, some margin calls as well everywhere. Uh, so we had the headline of the, <coughs> of the nickel uh, blowout on, and the margin call. And I think those margin calls are, are literally spreading to, uh, to the region. And plus, as an investor, um, when there is a crisis like we have, very often what investors will be doing, that they will be selling all their non-US exposure 
Okay, so they start with Europe, they'll be um, uh, same with Russia uh, and same with China. So as always, you're gonna have some players who will try to be buying the dips. So there has been some headlines of you know people uh, uh, buying the RSX or buying some CDS. Uh, I think BlackRock, for instance, is in big trouble. Apparently they bought a, a, a shitload of, of, of CDS there. Um, and that's the same with, with Europe. Uh, be always careful because when uh, um, US investors decide to reduce exposure, um, they do it like a big time and it takes quite a long time for them to come back. Um, so that is the, the, the picture for, for stocks, for some of the stocks, uh, looking at the, the crude oil uh, WTI. So the picture here, we had this trend that we started in March, 2021, that I was monitoring and monitoring. So it worked, it worked well until it doesn't. And, and that means when you trade commo commodities, you need to have st stop loss um, like uh, on, on any asset class, but you, you see the move here, we go from 96 to 130 very quickly. Then you have a, a lot of candles, but you know, unless you are very advanced, uh, should I say investor, um, probably not uh, the best thing to, to be trading. Volatility is really too high. So I know that many retail traders are, are always looking for those big, quick winners. Um, but to be honest, from my experience, that that doesn't work uh, that much. So uh, gold, um, gold, I never know what is the ticker on that platform. Uh, let's try, let's try this one. So do we have something? So gold is making new highs. Uh, I might have a better gold on this one. Where is my gold? Is it this one? Yeah. So gold uh, picture making new, almost new highs. Uh, went yesterday to the 2060, 2070. Uh, has been coming down uh, since then. Uh, again, silver, gold, um, a lot of, of retail traders going for it. From uh, my past experience, I'm not a big fan of gold, but look, um, in, in times of risk off, it works pretty well. Um, so uh, at least for this year, it has, it has done, done the job. Euro dollar, uh, so euro dollar, uh, since the uh, forever, we have been looking at this, uh, at this support. So let me give you a weekly chart uh, to give you a long-term picture. So that is something that I was advocating to be buying uh, the support. Um, if you've been watching the uh, the webinar for, for the 2022 IDs, I was telling you that I was at a stop loss at 109.50. So uh, the, the stop loss is down now. Uh, I don't know much. Um, I, I have no clear picture. Uh, I think now uh, if we carry on with the risk of market, we could be seeing the 105. Um, clearly everything is, is going uh, same direction. Either you are in risk on or risk off. So it doesn't matter uh, if you think that you are diversified by having many, many things. The reality is, is very binary market. Um, looking at the, uh, finally, I want to discuss a bit of uh, US 10 years. Uh, so let me give you the US 10 years. Where is the US 10 year? Up. So US 10 year here at 2%, as I said. So we are almost back to the level that uh, we had in, uh, in, at the end of January. Um, so let me review the daily. So um, CPI today, Fed next week. Um, so it, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be that easy for central banks because on one hand uh, you get a chance of US recession and on the other hand, there is a lot of, of, of inflation. So a um, lot of inflation means they need to be uh, hiking rates. On the other hand, if the economies are really slowing, um, they don't want to do too much. So um, what they have been saying so far and what they have been uh, telling us to, uh, today through the, through the ECB is that they want uh, um, to do whatever they can uh, to limit inflation. That is something that we'll have to check. But the US 10 years, this, this is the picture. If you look now at the uh, 10 years versus the two year, which is the flattening of the yield curve, we are now at 30 bips. Why we want to look at these 30 bips, and now we're gonna come back into here, is something that we have been discussing over and over, which is the, the yield curve. Uh, here I'm using a, a chart from, um, from Bloomberg, um, and it's looking at the 10 years versus the two years. And over the last 50 years, uh, that has been a great leading indicator to tell us 
if there is a, a recession coming. So question of, of one of the questions from this webinar is how we, is the US economy uh, going into recession? Um, if you look at that chart, we are getting close to uh, in, an inversion between the 10 years and the two years. Very often that will lead uh, over the next 12 to 18 months into a US recession. What is the uh, high yield uh, market telling us? So here we are looking at the high yield versus the US treasury, the US 10 years, and that's the, the spread between the two uh, for the time being. And, and if you want to do it, uh, it's not rocket science. You can be using the St. Louis Fred website. You can see that we are roughly at 4% spread, which historically is, is pretty low. Um, so if we look at the spread uh, between the high yield, meaning the very risky uh, 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 companies' um, bonds and the very secure or risk-free rate uh, uh, of the US 10 years, um, at 4%, historically, that is pretty low. So that is more or less pricing less than 20% chance of a US recession. So for the time being, if we look at the US yield, uh, uh, chance of a US recession are pretty limited, but we know it works is you don't have uh, uh, much stress into the high yield market until you have a ton happening. Uh, so that means when you start to see the economy going uh, uh, deteriorates very quickly, it could be uh, spreading into the high yield market. What about, uh, what is the S&P 500? Um, uh, forecasting in terms of, of the U.S. recession. So if we look at the highs, uh, uh, from, from, from the highs to the lows that we had recently, so we are talking here for the S&P, we are roughly talking that the market down between 13 to 15%. Um, so on the 8th of March, the S&P 500 was down 13% from its highs. If you look at the last 11 recessions, uh, the S&P 500 has been averaging down 26% uh, losses. So if you just look at a number like this one, if you take 13% versus 26%, in other words, that the equity market uh, through the S&P 500 is pricing a 50% chance of a US recession. So a high yield market less than 20%, um, but the US market, equity market, at the moment is pricing a 50% chance. And as well, the um, uh, yield curve, the, uh, in the potential inversion of the yield curve is getting closer and closer. So there is more and more chances that um, in the next 12 to 18 months, there's gonna be a recession in the US. Um, next week, as I said before, the Fed is gonna be meeting and, and, and making uh, its, de its decision re regarding the Fed fund rates. Um, expectations are for them to be hiking. As I said before, there is another meeting in the start of, 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 um, of May and another one in June. And overall, over these next three months, we are expecting the Fed to increase uh, yields by uh, rates, sorry, by 100 bips. So it's a bit of a conundrum where on the one hand, you got inflation where you need to be hiking uh, rates. And on the other hand, there is a potential US recession coming uh, soon. Um, potentially even more the case uh, uh, and, and, and the situation in, in, in the Ukraine is, is really weakening uh, both the case of a strong economy, uh, meaning potentially um, uh, US uh, going into recession in 2023 and as well more inflation. So that is the picture for, for the, the potential US going into uh, the recession. Quickly looking at the European markets now. So here, this is the picture of, um, of the V2X, which is the, uh, in other words, the volatility for the Eurostox 50. So the Eurostox 50 is the, uh, is the index that is making up 50 of the big stocks in, in Europe. So the, here in, 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 on that chart, in yellow, you get the V2X. So that's the volatility for Europe. And in, in, um, in red, we get the volatility for, uh, for the US with the, the VIX, which is the implied volatility for the next bonds on the S&P 500. As you can see, recently there has been a huge widening, widening of the spread. Uh, we are talking uh, 10 to 20% um, more implied volatility. Why, again, 
because of the of the Ukraine Ukraine crisis. But that means, in other words, that really uh, the European market is under a lot more stress than any other markets. But that means as well that there is the, the, there might be for us as traders and investors many more opportunities. So I would like um, um, to to carry on with that presentation uh, where here we get the charts of several indexes uh, looking at the CAC in green, which is for France, the DAX in yellow, the, the stocks fi uh, 50, uh, we get the MIB, which is for Italy. And I put as well the S SX7P, uh, which is for the European banks. So you can see uh, the European banks in, in, in pink um, at the start of this year outperformed the market by quite a lot. We are talking 10 to 15%. Why? Because um, um, investors across the world were very positive on European banks, again, uh, based on, on better uh, European economy and as well with yields uh, going higher. Unfortunately, suddenly, um, the news uh, hit the fan, and you can see that now uh, the SX7P is back to um, more or less the, the, the returns that we had uh, for other indexes. But you can see that very quickly, this odd performance um, has been killed. We are talking, you know, uh, uh, roughly 15, day, 15 sessions. So what are the European markets doing these days? Um, so here I put the... Um, 19 uh, super sectors of the uh, in Europe. So in the US, uh, you can do the same. And that's one of the slides that I used before looking at the S&P. There are 11 sectors uh, in the S&P. You can do the same uh, for European markets. So in yellow, this is for the stock 600, which is um, the big index. And it's a better uh, index than the stocks 50 because it represents literally 600 stocks in, in Europe. So it's more or less like the S&P 500 for, for Europe. Here, you, that is the picture um, as of yesterday's close where we had this massive rally. And what, what is interesting is obviously the, the, perform, the, the performance of the performance, sorry, sorry, of yesterday were really the, the stocks, the, the sectors that were uh, struggling before. So we are talking auto, we are talking banks, traveling. Um, but through that, um, that picture, literally similar to doing for the S&P, you can start to be drilling down and finding the sectors and names that you could be interested in. Um, that is exactly like uh, the same as the US, basic resources, oil and gas are the only two sectors uh, that are up on the year. Uh, why? Because the, the, the story is the same everywhere. Um, now you investors will be going for basic resources and oil and gas. So looking at these European markets, what has been interesting, and here this is a chart from, from Barclays, um, we can see, the, so here this is the flows going into, into Europe. So what investors have been, where investors have been allocating money. Um, you can see that until November uh, last year, until now, investors were putting money into, into Europe, December a bit less, then we got a lot of inflows in January, and then suddenly investors have been pretty much uh, reducing their exposure, or actually dumping their exposure. So here you get a big move um, where a lot of outflows in Europe. Uh, so in other words, um, I can tell you from my experience, you know, uh, in 2007, 2008, uh, with the Italian stories, with the Greek stories, is you're going to have for several months uh, US investors and world investors putting money in Europe and suddenly they will be flipping. And when they flip, uh, the volumes, the size is like, you know, over two, three, four sessions, they will be flipping the position big time. So similar picture here, if you look at the flows, so that's for the pan-European banks ETF flows. So that explained the picture that we had before when the uh, uh, European index outperformed the overall market. Why? Because you know, for, for something to outperform, obviously you need an, a, a lot of inflows. Uh, so that is that was the picture in January where everyone was bullish. European banks, we are talking Deutsche Bank, Unicredito, BNP, any European bank um, from, from Spain to, uh, to Italy would have been up you know, 30 to 50%. Then, Suddenly, you start to see a lot of outflows. 
Why? Because we, there is risk of, of exposure to, uh, to, to, to Russia. There is a lot of, um, um, of uh, weaknesses due to uh, um, potentially uh, Europe going into recession and you get these big outflows. So what we want to do from there is, is we want always to understand, you know, where is the money going? So here, this is a chart of, uh, and you can do the same on, on trading view. Uh, so this is the performance of, of the European banks versus the, the stock 600. Um, again, same picture, we go up in January and then we go down. Um, and, and, and why we want to do that is we want to understand what is the, where to allocate money. So uh, recently I've done uh, two um, videos on where to, put, where to trade based on, on, on regions. Uh, what is very important when we do uh, for people who have done the four by four and people, or people who, who, who are doing the mentoring is when we start from the index and we scroll down, we want to be finding the good sectors and the good industries. Um, so the beauty now these days is we get a lot of indexes. For, for Europe, um, what we have is those 10 industries are broken down, as we see here, in 19 super sectors. So those 19 super sectors will have indexes. Um, there is absolutely no excuse, you know, when retail traders are telling me, you know, oh yes, Greg, but I can't do it because I don't have access to, to the data. So here, this is from investing.com. Everything is for free. Uh, on investing.com, you can be building your watch list. So what you need to do is building uh, your watch list for European markets sectors. Here you get all the symbols and you're going to have the prices and then you can be checking the prices you can be looking at the performance uh, and we are talking from the stock 600 which is here the main index through all the other um, indexes meaning the, the sectors if we go quickly um, into sectors what we like to do is understand what is inside those sectors so here i, I went into um and the uh, Eurex website, uh, maybe we can do it if I manage to copy and paste. Uh, no, I can't. But uh, the idea is you go into the, the, this Eurex, um, uh, the stocks, stoxx.com uh, slash index, and you will find on those pages, you know, uh, the overview of the, the index. So here, this is for the X, X, X7P, but as well the components, meaning what is this index made of? Um, and that is key. Why? Because you want to find inside the sectors, inside the industries, what are the outperformers and the underperformers. In a market like we have these days, everything is binary. So everything is selling off, meaning, you know, uh, most uh, stocks will be, will be done uh, literally the, the same. But what you would like, like to have very quickly is to identify, you know, stocks uh, that you think are going to outperform. Um, and you can be looking at this, uh, looking at the different performances. So now quickly, I would like to jump into the, the oil market because obviously oil market is making the headlines. Um, and, um, and, and I know that um, I got many questions from people saying, you know, look, Greg, you know, I want to be trading oil market. How can I be trading the oil market? Uh, let's look now uh, first at, at the fundamentals. Um, so that's a chart very similar that I've been using over the last uh, three months, a couple of years, which tells us about the picture of uh, for commodities, we are always looking at supply and demand. Okay, so where is the market? You need to keep in mind that uh, the oil market overall has got roughly 100 million barrels that are consumed every single day. And the supply is fluctuating around these 100 million. So that's the picture that we had pre-crisis. When we had the, the world stopping in, in, in 2020, the world consumption of oil went down by 20%. So literally almost overnight, we went from 100 million barrels to 80 million barrels. So as we had only 80 million barrels in demand and you get a huge supply, what happens is you get this spike here where you get between 15 and 20 billion surplus of oil in um, March, April last year. Then what the, the OPEC did is they reduced massively the production. So they met and said, we need to reduce uh, uh, production. Why? Because the, the demand is not that big. Plus there is a lot of reserves that are sitting everywhere. So you remember the time when there were tankers uh, literally sitting in the, next to Singapore, 
um, because there were there was no buyer. So for months and months, then you started to have deficit on the oil market. But then uh, they increase slowly the production. So all the data that you have here are from the IAA, and where and that was uh, before the uh, Ukraine crisis. Okay, so we are talking end of February. So at the end of February, the expectations were for, for this year, here in 2022, for a bit of a, of a surplus in terms of production uh, versus demand, but not, not that big. So oil, the oil market was already a bit stretched. Uh, why? Because op the OPEC uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, not be 100% producing oil. So when you have this situation, uh, we had oil trading around the 85. And as I said before, my uh, bias was for oil to go, uh, uh, to be neutral, to go up. Now that, um, that the world has decided to go for an, an embargo, what you have is WTI went through the roof. Okay, so if we look here, this is uh, similar, this is for, for, from Barclays, uh, where we see the, um, the weekly sigma moves in front most uh, in front most brand futures and that was as of fri friday uh, you can assume that uh, the chart is probably around here now because we went to 130 so versus history we are very close to uh, 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 an oil shock in terms of how wti has been moving um and and this uh, move of the uh, uh, wti um historically um, has been uh, affecting differently uh, sectors. So I think this, this, uh, this table is very, very important. Um, and, and it's a table from, from Barclays where you can see, uh, so here, this is the average and the median moves uh, on any oil shock for those different sectors, where we see that telecom uh, banks, autos, durables, uh, retail and tech hardware. So everything that is, that is down there, uh, I've been hit the hardest when there is um, when there is an oil shock. Um, so we need to be putting aside the banks because obviously this is mostly uh, this is a bit distorted by 2008 uh, great financial crisis. But when there is a spike in oil, when the world is facing higher energy uh, and gas uh, costs, uh, consumers will generally absorb those costs. Uh, but a cartel spending in other areas. So in other words, the big losers of uh, higher oil commodities and prices are not necessarily companies with, which can have high level of oil and commodities as input cost, but more the companies which have high exposure to consumer spending. So all the, all the sectors that are the worst when oil is spiking are really the sectors that have a lot of exposure to consumer spending. Um, and I think the, really the, this one, uh, this table in terms of ID, ID generation is probably the most important uh, uh, for the next three to, to nine months. So um, print it, do something about it. Uh, it it's a brilliant uh, table that is uh, uh, from, um, from uh, Barclays. But what about what we are facing now? If you remember the slides that we had before, the market, you know, 100 million uh, um, um, uh, production and, and 100 million demand uh, uh, every single day. But we know that Russia uh, is now uh, facing a huge embargo. So Russia has been producing roughly 11 million barrels every single day. These days is around 11.3 million. If we look at, um, at what Russia is doing, so here this is IA source, it's the same as, as before. Um, we know that Russia is the third producer in the world uh, after the US with 17.6 million uh, and, and uh, Saudi Arabia are producing 12 million. But the most important part is um, as they are exporting eight, roughly 8 million or 65% of their production, production sorry, we know that uh, uh, there's going to be a big imbalance. Okay, it's not news to you, probably if you're watching BBC or any uh, programs that um, there is an imbalance. Now it's about, you know, to calibrate and to quantify this, this imbalance, uh, depending on the size of the embargo. So what is the, what is the Russian crude and, and oil product exports? So here, this is literally the production here. If we take uh, those numbers into play, 
If you are in the US, so here we are looking at the US trade balance of petroleum products uh, since 2000. So in 2008, to, uh, uh, during that period between 2004 and even 2014, the US were very much uh, uh, running a big deficit. So they were importing, they had to import a lot of oil uh, until 2014, 2015. Then afterwards with the fracking, uh, the production went literally, they, they increased production massively. So now they are flattish, uh, so they don't need to import. Uh, they could be uh, self-sufficient in terms of, of production. So it's not very surprising to see the US saying, look guys, we want to have a huge embargo on oil because it's not that they don't care because the price of, of oil going higher will be, is, is, will be painful for, for everyone, but at least, they are not in the same position as other players. And here I'm talking uh, in Europe. Um, so we know that Germany is importing a lot of gas, of oil uh, for, from, from Russia. Uh, that's the same in the UK. So in, in other words, uh, when we get a, a, a shock like this one, we need again to quantify by how much um, we're gonna have a deficit. So if we look um, uh, of the recent uh, um, oil supply shocks, we are talking of, of um, supply suddenly that goes offline between 1.5 million to uh, 6 million. Um, now the expectations uh, for, the, uh, for Russia are we are talking probably around 3 million to 4, bar 4 million barrels that could be off uh, to the rest of the world. So 3 to 4 million barrels that you need to find. And if you don't find them, prices will be adjusting to probably $200. And as well, it could create a big recession because um, 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 retail companies will not gonna have oil that, um, that they will need. So that will uh, literally kill the economy by, and we are probably talking killing the, the world economy by two to 3%. So the only time that we had recession over the last 20 years was in 2020 and in 20, eight where the world economy was only down two to three percent so what the world is facing is absolutely the same which is if we don't find ways to very quickly uh, balance those three to four million barrels the world the world of all will go into the uh, recession so this is why these days obviously we get a lot of talks uh, for uh, venezuela uh, coming back into uh, into production and and being able to export to the rest of the world. Uh, this is the same with Iran. So there are a lot of talks. So last week, um, it sounded very much like, you know, the, uh, the deal will be done with Iran. So those are what the, the world is facing. Here, this is the, the disruption in barrels day that Goldman uh, is estimating. So we are talking roughly 3 million barrels. Um, as you can see, we had uh, higher numbers in the, in the past, but literally, the problem now that we are facing is, uh, it feels very much like this embargo is not gonna be for three to six months. It's gonna be a very, very long dated um, embargo, which uh, implies that we need to find a substitute very quickly. Oil market, uh, that is the structure. So I didn't, uh, unfortunately, that's uh, from, uh, from yesterday uh, afternoon, but just looking at the structure of the, uh, the oil curve, uh, so WTI is trading in backwardation, um, but you can see as well that uh, uh, the front month, the, the front month, uh, the next three to four months are very high uh, versus the, um, the the more uh, long dated month. Uh, so that is why the the, the curve is 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 that steep. Okay, um, quickly now that uh, we covered recession. Uh, the potential uh, recession in the US, how to find an, an, uh, IDs in Europe and looking at the oil market, I just want to uh, quickly inform you that there is a group mentoring session on Saturday. So this is for the trading community. Uh, so the thing that we're gonna be doing, it's gonna be doing something that is very similar to the mentoring sessions that I do on one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom. Uh, so that's very much the, the same structure. Um, what um, the different participants will be doing, they will be sending IDs. Um, so if you haven't done it, you have the time until tomorrow, send IDs for long, long, short pair trade. Um, 
that would be better if it's for stocks. We will be uh, looking at those IDs and how to structure those, those IDs, very similar to, to the four by four video series, looking first at a macro picture as a catalyst, then the quantitative analysis, then the qualitative analysis, plus technical analysis, price action, then we're gonna be doing the risk uh, management and money management. So uh, that is something that I will do for the community, uh, only for the community access, uh, 60 to 90 minute session, and that will be on, on Saturday at 1 p.m. Uh, for the others, uh, what I can do, uh, where I'm put, I can poten potentially help you, we have a trading community. We now have more than 80 traders. Uh, we try to uh, share ideas uh, all together, long, long, short, macro, how to, um, to have a better uh, trading infrastructure. So those are all the things that I know from my experience that many traders have been, have been struggling to find a good community and finding good help. As a trader, what happens is very much you're going to be facing your screen and you're going to be on your own. So um, um, I know that many uh, people were asking for this trading community. I know that many educators are saying that they have a trading community and they don't have any of those. So I hope it's, it's going to be helping and, and we're all going to be benefiting from it. The second uh, um, tool where I can help you is the four by four video series. So that's a video series that I built in uh, 2019 based on my experience of, of trading, uh, long, short, long prop trading, um, 20 years of trading experience, plus my experience as a mentor for another company, where I saw uh, too many people struggling with, uh, um, with strategies or for investment process that didn't work. And then um, finally, the mentoring, uh, those are uh, um, around three to five months sessions that we'll do on Zoom, where I'm going to help you uh, building your portfolio and getting a real investment process, professional investment process. So this is where I can help you. If you get questions about today, what we covered uh, with the uh, US recession, the European uh, sectors, or the oil market, please send me an email. If you get questions on the 4x4 or the, um, the mentoring, please do so as well. Um, again, next week is going to be a very busy week, normally with the, the Fed meeting on Wednesday, then we get the, the, the big expiry uh, on Friday. So that's going to be very interesting for the next uh, few days uh, and, and weeks. So now the S&P is at 42.40, uh, two hours from the close. Again, very volatile market, adjust your risk management. Uh, that is something that is key. Uh, if you want to be successful, it's, you need to be strong with your risk management. Um, if you can do that first, then you'll be potentially very successful. Thank you for joining. See you soon. And for the ones from the community, please, uh, happy to see you on Saturday. All the best. Bye-bye.